Welcome to the Penguin Podcast. Just a friendly note that this episode contains some adult themes. Hello and welcome to the Penguin Podcast, the place where leading authors chat about their creative process by choosing a handful of objects that have inspired them. I'm Katie Brand and today I'm joined by Kit Duval. Her first novel, My Name is Leon, a story about a young boy and his brother going through foster care, received awards, critical acclaim and was an international bestseller. Since then, Kit set up a scholarship for working class writers, written short stories and two more books, including her most recent novel, The Trick to Time. And Kit has kindly brought along objects that have inspired her work. These include a photo of Forlorn Point in Wexford, Ireland, and a track by Scott Matthews. Kit Duval, welcome. Hello. Hello. Thank you very much for joining us. So before we crack on and get into talking about the book and your creative process uh, and the objects that you've brought along, can you give us just a brief synopsis of The Trick to Time for anyone listening who hasn't read it yet? Sure. So The Trick to Time is really Mona's story. And when the book opens, Mona is about three days off being 60. And she's really saying to herself, is this it? Is this my life? And she knows that when she was a young girl, something happened to her that has prevented her moving on. And so she gets to the point where she says, no more, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to go out there, I'm going to have a life. And she meets somebody and it's really whether or not she's going to go in that direction or if she's going to let what happened to her when she was a young woman particularly redefine her. Um, So it's a love story. It's also about identity and loss. Actually, it's about, you know, what it is to find yourself post 50, nearly 60 and thinking, who am I as a woman? Who am I as a person? So she lives on the coast of England. She's from Ireland. She runs a sort of small shop that hand makes dolls. And the novel sort of moves around in the chronology of her own life, yes. doesn't it? Back yes. and forth. Was that a device that you deliberately used, the sense of flipping between the chronologies all the time to give a sense that literally everything in your past, your present and your future could be happening over and over again in that moment and you can make choices about where you go? Was that Absolutely. something conscious that you did? Um, it- If I had thought about it when I started the novel, I would never have done it because technically it was a massive challenge having essentially three timelines. It's Mona as a child, Mona at around 19 and then Mona in the present day. And what I wanted to do was show how pivotal events shape us and we don't let go of them. And as our understanding of who we are changes that moment becomes more significant or less significant. We put it into context. And that's certainly what is happening to Mona. The other thing that I wanted to explore in in this novel and in Leon is that when massive events happen, big political events happen, there are small tragedies, small domestic things that happen over there. And this big thing's happening here. And your small thing is overshadowed by the big thing. And for Mona... The Birmingham pub bombings happened, which was a massive thing. But she was just having her baby on that day. And it's how that big thing impacted that small domestic tragedy. Same happened with My Name is Leon. The riots were going on. But actually, this little boy was having his own tragedy over here. Yes. And do you think that makes it sometimes harder for people to move on from an event that's small in the grand scheme of things, but domestically huge for them? It's sort of complicated with some sense of survivor's guilt about the bigger thing. Yes, absolutely. And and you might say, well, actually, I broke my leg on 9-11 and people are going to go really? That's not very important Mm. because this massive tragedy happened. It's funny, talking as well about sort of small events that can happen in your life. We were talking about 9-11. I was watching an interview many years ago about a man who had been spared being in the building. One of the towers was his office simply because he decided on his way to work he didn't like the tie he was wearing. And so he'd stopped into a shop just to buy a new tie to change it over. Took about, he said, seven minutes. And him being seven minutes late for work meant the the doors were shut and the building was on fire by the time he got there. Oh my goodness. And I just think in a way that can be as haunting or you can become as obsessed in your own life with that and then that can leave you in a rut. So all these little ways, that the sort of worm wormholes yes. in you that, that the come over ifs. time. Yes. The what ifs. I was brought up as a Jehovah's Witness. Jehovah's Witnesses believed in the 70s that the world was going to end in 1975. So 
I was going to die in 1975 because all bad people were going to die and I completely believed I was bad because I was quite <laughs> naughty. So I can remember the shock of finding myself 21 and thinking, I'm not dead. How is it that I'm not dead? It sweeps over me every so often that actually I'm still alive. And I do not believe Jehovah's Witnesses' teachings at all, intellectually. But the seed of my very early death, and I can't get rid of it. And it consequently made me very, very wild till I was 21 because I left home at 16, stopped being a Jehovah's Witness at 16, but I still believed I was going to die. So I was like, bring on the sex, drugs and rock and roll, bring it. I'm having it because I'm going to die at any moment. The other side of that is when I didn't die at around 21, 22, and I thought, actually, you've got to stop taking drugs, you're going to kill yourself. It made me just think, what's out there? What, what can I do? What can I experience that is a bit more healthy? And also completely live every day of your life and enjoy every day of your life because I definitely had a sense of time running out for me. And I think when I was writing Mona, I definitely felt here was somebody that could put that right. Here, this, here was someone that could go back to that time when she believed and just sort of say, I'm going to have a future now. I'm going to not let that event redefine me and I'm going to live. I'm going to enjoy. I'm going to be here. So we mentioned earlier in passing the making of wooden dolls and uh, you've brought along a photo of a wooden doll as your first object. Yes. Tell us why you've brought that as your first object. Sure, if I can find it. So what you're doing now is looking at the photos of the objects on your phone. Right. So I made a Pinterest board because I'm slightly anal. And <laughs> the Pinterest board was where I lodged that photograph. Oh, wow of the wooden dolls that I describe the carpenter making and Mona yes. painting and dressing. I think I sort of imagine them more sort of like anatomical sort of yes. like dressmakers, dummies. Yes, yes. and there are some of those photographs as well mm. on the Pinterest board. Um, they're lovely, they're I, beautiful. I describe them as having a sort of medieval look, yes, which, they do. which they have. And they're very fine and they have these very beautiful articulated joints that he makes. The significance of the dolls in the book is weighty, isn't it? And, yes. And sort of difficult emotionally. If you wouldn't mind just outlining what the function and role of the dolls in, in the trick to time sure. is. Apart from those dolls which Mona sells, dresses and sells in her shop, there are other dolls that the carpenter makes. Here's a photo of the doll baby, another one of my objects. This doll here, which is just a lump of wood, more or less in a sort of lozenge shape. And these dolls correspond to the weight of a baby. So if a woman lost a baby, stillborn baby, and it was six pounds, two ounces, the carpenter will make a doll of six pounds, two ounces. And Mona uses those dolls to help women that have had a loss, stillborn loss, to grieve. And it's very much Mona manipulating time. She encourages the women to speak about what they would have done with their baby as their baby grew up. They go into a sort of reverie, don't yes. they, under her guidance. It's yes. a form of therapy that she provides for these slightly nervous women that come in and part of the therapeutic aspect of these dolls and the need for them to be the precise weight of the baby is that Mona had something that a lot of these women wouldn't have had at the time where it was forbidden even for a stillborn baby to be brought back to the mother for her to hold. It would just be taken away Completely. and they might never see it again. Completely. And they may not even, then it may not even be a grave or a proper funeral. So the sense of the woman feeling the weight of what her baby would have been in her arms is a, is a kind of tactile, visceral Absolutely. sort of response. Where did you find that idea? Was that something you just completely created or had you heard that this can happen? I completely made it up and in fact when the book was sold to Germany the PR people over there got back to me and said look you know we really need to put some links on our website to where the people can find about the doll therapy and I was like I made it up so there is no doll therapy yeah. I have no idea where it came from but it seemed to really make sense and I mean I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't something similar somewhere in some more you know primitive communities where perhaps people do give people their baby and say feel the weight of it and try and remember and live a life and then we'll take it away but in the 70s 
when people had a stillborn baby, the, the child was taken away and put in a sluice room. And in the sluice room, you'd have bits of liver or somebody's leg that they lost. And the baby, because it was a piece of flesh that was dead and no, not, no longer wanted, that's where the baby went till the end of the day. And then it was put in the incinerator. Mm. There was no grave. There was no ceremony. The woman may never have held her baby in her arms. It was whipped away. On the occasion of Mona um, losing her baby, the nurse against all the rules, brought the baby back with a little white flower in its fist. Mm. And that actually happened. My cousin, who was a trainee nurse at the time on a maternity ward, trainee midwife, she did that for somebody. And the nurse in your story gets in trouble for doing that. Oh, absolutely. She, the midwife is not happy about this. Not at all happy. And one of the reasons she's not happy is because the baby has been in the sluice room with potential diseases. Also, it was very much seen, as, as I found out from the maternity nurses that I spoke to, it was a kindness to take the baby away. No one was doing it to be cruel. The prevailing thought at the time was, your baby is dead. Why would you want to have that baby? Because I'm going to take it off you in, in half an hour. So I'll just take it off you now. We'll call it quits, go home, get pregnant again, have another baby, get over it. And so when my cousin did that, she was also told off. And that was largely to do with downstairs in the hospital, the same hospital. They were dealing with the results of an IRA bomb on that night. Mm. And Mona was Irish. Mm -hmm. And so they were not sympathetic to her, which, yes. again, really happened. Mm -hmm. Years later, she sort of starts to feel well again through making the dolls uh, and all that kind of thing. But the landscape as well is a big part of it, isn't it? And the sea and the yes. therapy that the sea can provide that I, I really related to as well, that sense of seeing a wide, clear horizon yes. that can just wash your mind. Completely. It feels like something that's quite important for you. Yeah, absolutely. So I was born in Birmingham, which is the most landlocked part of the UK. And I don't think I saw the sea till I was, you know, a teenager. And when I saw it, I was shocked. I mean, it to me, how how I managed to not live by the sea now is a miracle because every, I'd say once a month I get this thing where I'm like, oh, my God, I've got to go and see the sea. Yeah. I don't need to touch it. I don't need to get my feet wet. I have to stand by it and just allow it to do its thing. What that thing is... I have no idea and I'm not even ever going to try and explain it. But there is something so profoundly calming and healing for me to just hear that endless shush and lullaby of the sea and to just see those waves coming over and over and over again. I absolutely love it. So I gave it to Mona as her way of being healed and certainly what her father said to her, by the sea, all worries wash away. And I definitely believe that. I find it very difficult to write a book where I won't have the sea doing its thing in it. In fact, <laughs> yes. my next book, I'm trying to make it a very inland story. <laughs> <laughs> I get a slight sense from from the way you've said that, that it might not last. <laughs> no, it won't. I know it won't. <laughs> Someone fact, will make a break for the sea yeah. at some point. What's that line? Is it an E.E. E. Cummings line about whatever we lose, whether a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find in the sea? Is oh, that I a love line? that. I haven't heard that. I put it in a book I wrote because I, I like to write about the sea as well. And um, I had a character who had to go to the sea in Cornwall. That sort of sense of going under and baptising yes. yourself. I've done that myself in, uh, several times in my life. Really? Sort of baptised myself, gone under, made a conscious decision to come back and have just let something go or forget something. I haven't actually ever submerged myself in the sea. I've always felt I'm a little bit scared of of the sea to be mm. honest um, but I really like that idea I think that's very powerful mm. I mean I'm pretty anti-baptism for obvious reasons oh yes but, but in, in to the baptise yourself though yes, yes and in the more holistic sense and non sort of spiritual sense of letting something go and leaving it in the water mm. yeah so I will now be trying that okay thank you thank you, <laughs> thank you priestess Katie no no not at all <laughs> no, not at all there's enough sea for all of us luckily but let's move on to your next object now so it feels like a good time to do it because it is a picture of Forlorn Point in Kilmore Quay so why have you brought this along particularly I'm half Irish and the half of me that is Irish comes from Wexford I'm not from Kilmore. I'm from a tiny place called Campile, mm. but that's what Forlorn Point looks like. Oh, lovely. Kilmore Quay in Wexford is very, very beautiful. It's a little fishing village. It's right on the southern point tip of the east coast. 
And I had spent some time there. And when I imagined Mona as a child, I most definitely wanted her to be in Kilmore Quay so that I could go back for research purposes. Um, <laughs> Flights are tax deductible. Absolutely. But I didn't know. Act- oh, I didn't know that either. I didn't know there was this place called Forlorn Point. I knew there was Kilmore, but I didn't know that this particular bay that I was describing was called Forlorn Point. And someone told me And I thought how perfect that phrase was for what was going on for Mona's father and for Mona because uh, Mona's father went there to grieve the loss of his wife and could be found down there uh, for many months after his wife died, just staring out at sea and being healed. And he and Mona got older at Kilmore Key. lost her mother. Who's lost her mother. Mm. And so they spend their, their grief time down at Forlorn Point it's an incredibly beautiful part of the world. It's very unspoilt, sandy beaches with dunes, just as I describe in the book. And I believe you recorded The Sound of the Sea on your phone I did. as part of the process of realising the book? Absolutely. I went to Kilmore Quay. I stood there. I took a panoramic photograph and I filmed The Sound of the Sea. And I'm sure The Sound of the Sea in Kilmore Quay is The Sound of the Sea anywhere. But to me, I know that's the sea in Kilmore Quay. So I would have that playing, particularly in the traumatic times of Mona's life or the times when she went down to the sea. There's a very particular scene where she's had an encounter with someone she thought she would have a relationship with and it hasn't worked out. And she goes down to stand at the water's edge and this is actually happening in Hastings. And she throws into the water a bottle of wine that she'd bought, which they were going to share, which isn't going to work work out. And she throws the bottle of wine into the sea and she imagines it washing up in Kilmore Quay, her bottle of wine, and she thinks, yep, that's it, that's the end of it. Mm -hmm. And I, I really... I played the sound of that, uh, the sea in Kilmore Quay and imagined her thinking, across the water there, my bottle of wine's going to wash up and how significant that was for her. And in terms of you making that physical recording to use as part of the writing process, was that a new thing for you or is that something you do very often? It's usually part of the process. It may not be a sound recording, but it would definitely be photographs. For example, for Leon, I found a photograph on Google of a little black boy on a a bicycle and I pinned that to the corner of my computer. There will always be a visual thing. I'm not very good at describing things, I don't think. I have to work at descriptions, like you were talking about landscape. That that doesn't come naturally to me. What comes naturally to me in any of my novels is what people are doing. He's doing that, she's doing that, he said this, he, she said that. Then I have to think, but they're in a room. What does the room look like? And I have to make myself describe it. So visual cues really help. And I usually make a Pinterest board. I've got a Pinterest board for everything I've ever written. And you meticulously plot everything as well, don't you? Meticulously, to really down to some serious detail. And I have a spreadsheet, like I say, an anal person. I've got a spreadsheet of the chapter and what the chapter should contain and blah, blah, blah. And then once I've done it, I don't look at it again. So I plot it until I know it intimately. And then that's gone then. I never need to look at the plot again once I know it. And just going back to, you mentioned about My Name is Leon and that book about family ties and family and how it can be lost through your other work outside of your writing profession. So you worked in family law, you worked with adoption panels, uh, an advisor for social services. Do you want to give people a voice in that way? What I do is just think of what interests me and I'm I write about that. And if my interests inevitably are uh, marginalised people, people that have voice, that's going to bleed into my work. There's not, there's no way of stopping it. But I never start from the position of, here's this community I want to write about so that people know about them. I'm just not that mm-hmm. thoughtful, really. I'm just going to write about the things that are in my heart. But obviously, compassion and empathy are part of your makeup as a person. Where do you think that originates from? I was brought up in poverty, in an Irish community, in a black community uh, as a Brummie. I lived in Mosley Village. Mosley Village was a very weird bohemian village within Birmingham where anything went. I've always been drawn to characters and to people on the fringes. I myself am somebody that likes the edge of the room. I like to be a watcher. And so I think that's sort of within me. And then 
just by the nature of the way the world's going and the nature of disadvantage, a lot of which I have witnessed or people, disadvantaged people I've worked with, I've always had that sense of injustice and why aren't those people taken care of? Why, why aren't those people listened to? Why aren't those people telling their own story instead of having their story mediated by somebody? And that infuriates me when people speak for other people rather than asking those people themselves. I saw it in criminal law, saw it in family law, saw it in the adoption panel. I was a magistrate for 10 years and I would always want to speak to the person themselves, even if they're not articulate, even if they don't know the right words, hear what they have to say. And I think perhaps, yes, that, that's where it comes from, my working life and the sense of being an outsider. I'm definitely, definitely an outsider myself. And as a person of mixed heritage, do you feel that pressure and how do you deal with that pressure to be some sort of spokesperson? I don't feel particularly that I have to take it on, although, you know, people will expect me to talk up about different issues. I am a black woman. I am an Irish woman. I'm a Brummie. I'm working class. I'm a woman of a certain age. It's a lot to get through. Exactly. <laughs> I'm, you know, there's, there's so many causes, if you like, I could get stuck into. Uh, and then and you're just, also you yourself. And I'm me. The author. And Kate that's Duvall, the most yes. important thing yes. to me, that I am me. And I can wear all those coats and I can wear all those hats and I'm absolutely fine too. But underneath all of them, I'm a human being. And that's what everybody wants. They want to be seen as not the black woman or not as the working class woman. They want to be seen as the totality of their identity which makes them who they are and I'm more than happy I've got more than enough energy to speak up about what I feel passionate about but at the end of the day I'm a combination of all of those things and I'm black and I'm white and I'm mixed race and I'm all of those things and not, none of them the same way the same way we all are and I think if that if ever I got the opportunity to say anything, it would be that. And there's a degree of perhaps frustration sometimes, pushing things away and saying, I just want to be me and I'm going to decide I would just like to be happy. I don't want to be the spokesperson for everything in the world every time I open my mouth. Totally. You know, there's all this stuff going on politically and it's an absolute nightmare and the whole of the world, to me, seems to have gone mad. And somebody wrote on Twitter, the world has gone mad. Here is a video of a kitten being blow-waved with a with a hairdryer and I thought yes absolutely <laughs> yeah. so at some point you do want to disconnect and unplug and just say I want to look at a kitten I want yeah. to look for me it's I want to look at the sea and I want to forget all of that and I want to be me and not the spokesperson and not the champion and not the activist I want to just eat chocolate biscuits sit in front of the telly and watch daytime tv yeah, yeah. I think I did something similar the other day about a tweet about a dog eating an ice cream yes yes <laughs> you just, it's, sometimes it's you really just go, important oh I just want to do this now absolutely um but just to say you know before we move on to your last object you know I think it's important to say that you, so many people talk about this but you've really put your money where your mouth is because you have also set up a scholarship for working class writers using your own money in advance from one of your own books to help people you're not a ladder puller upper no and you really have done a practical thing you must be very proud of it so I, I got my advances way before Leon came out maybe a year and a half before Leon came out and it was literally the first thing I did with any of the money before I spent any even I knew that I wanted to do this thing and I was so pleased to be able to do it and it was only afterwards that people were surprised about it I wasn't surprised about it when I told um Birkbeck University and Julia Bell, who's a friend of mine who runs creative writing course there, that I was going to do. I said, look, I really want to call it the Fat Chance Scholarship. I don't want to call it the Kit Deval Scholarship. I said, no, we want to use your name. And I was going, but every time I say to someone do a creative writing degree, they say Fat Chance. Mm. And so I thought that was a great name for it. I can understand why they wanted to, to use my name. But for me, to give people an opportunity to do something that actually would be beyond their means was so wonderful. I know the people that have benefited from it. It's very embedded in the university. It was a privilege to do. It was something almost that how could I not do rather than, you know, isn't it a great thing to do? It's like, well, of course I'm going to do it um, because I know what it's like to yearn and to feel that so many things are beyond me and so many things are out of reach. And I know that other people have been inspired to set up their own scholarships and to do other things by reading about the Kit Deval scholarship. So it's all wonderful. My only sort of sense of embarrassment is that I can't 
do more. It's so great. And I'm great to hear about it more from you. Um, let's go to your final object now, uh, which is a song called Mona by Scott Matthews. Which one came first in your life to some extent? Well, um, Scott Matthews is a singer-songwriter from Wolverhampton whose work I've loved for many years. So whenever he has a new album out, I will always buy it. And I was thinking about my next novel and I listened to two songs actually by him. One was called Mona and the other one was called Virginia. And I absolutely knew the story by the time both of those songs had finished. There's at least three lines in those two songs that you will find somewhere in the book, you know, lines um, about loss or the sea or loving somebody. The most beautiful song by such a talented an underrated singer-songwriter who I've met once. Mm. Does he know that he's been I such an inspirational so. I don't figure. think so, actually. I keep <laughs> meaning to send him a, a book because, you know, I really do have to thank him for the inspiration. They're not mournful songs, but they are incredibly beautiful songs about women mm. um, and about uh, two particular characters that, that want something and have lost something. And so did you have those playing when you were literally writing it? Many times, yeah, yeah, on a loop. And even now, if I listen to Mona in particular, I see her and I see what she's doing. And she's very, very real and still very much alive to me. A lot of authors have had either art or music or both yes. as, a, as a, a sort of relief, perhaps, from the words to some extent. Yes, so. the book that I'm planning next, I have found three songs all by the same artist It's the register. That's what it is. It's Mm -hmm. the register of the book. So I hear that song and I think, that's it. That's what I'm aiming for, that pitch and that voice. And it might be nothing to do with the words of the song, nothing to do with what the song's about, nothing to do with the speed, but it's it's something that chimes very deeply in me. And if I want to access the register of the book, I've only got to put the song on and I've got it. Like a vibration, it like is a resonance, exactly like, like in, a resonance in wood. Like yes, it resonates and you at that feel frequency. It and you go, there yeah. we go. I've got it now, and you, and I have to hold on to it yeah. for as long as I can, and then I'll lose it. And you do when yes. you're a writer, you lose the voice, and you go, I've I've slipped away and brings me back. That's great. And great writing advice, actually. Well, as we draw this to a close, let's go back to how we began uh, with the question of time. And I'd love to play a clip from the audiobook uh, now. There's a moment in the novel where Mona is playing on the beach and she's joined by her father. So let's have a listen to that now. Mona, he says, what do you think you're doing? Playing, Dada, she replies. Where do you think you should be? Where did I ask you to be now? With my mother. Doing what? But Dada. He crouches down until his big head is level with hers and takes both of her hands in his. He tugs on them. Is it boring with your mother, Mona? Because she can't go up and run into the waves with you like she used to. Because she can't sit you on her lap and brush her hair. Because she doesn't get out of bed. Is that it, Mona? As he speaks, he picks strands of Mona's white blonde hair from where it blows across her eyes. Yes, Tara. One day, he says, and his voice is kind so Mona knows she isn't getting a telling off. One day you will want these hours back, my girl. You will wonder how you lost them, and you will want to get them back. There's a trick to time. He stands up, brushes the sand from his trousers, and Mona jumps up onto his back for the ride home. He lollops over the dunes with her hands round his neck and her chest against his ribs. What's the trick, Dada? He likes to explain things, so Mona expects a good long answer that might delay them getting back home. You can make it expand or you can make it contract. Make it shorter or make it longer, he says. How? Mona clings to him. She looks out to sea for one last glimpse before it sinks over the brow of the hill and her father turns his head also. By the sea, all life's worries wash away, he says. 
That was The Trick to Time, written by my guest Kit Duval and read there by the absolutely wonderful Fiona Shaw. She is amazing. I will literally watch absolutely. anything up, <laughs> anything with her in it. Did you have any say over her? Oh, being I chose her. Oh, yes. I chose her, absolutely. <laughs> I, was, I was adamant I wanted her and I met her about two months ago mm-hmm. and I introduced myself and she said why did you write that book she said I was devastated when I was when I was reading it um and we it's had a, a very great, emotional book we had a great conversation about it she was asking lots of questions and bringing up parts that she remembered it was a complete privilege I've got a photograph of uh, us together in Ireland so it's lovely Great. When an audiobook works, it's just great. Very isn't it? good. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much for this fantastic chat. I've, I feel I've learned a lot <laughs> uh, from you, and it's been a real privilege to talk to you. Thank you very much, Kit, for joining us today. Thank you. And just a reminder to subscribe to the Penguin Podcast, and you'll get new free episodes twice a month. You can find us at sites like ACAST, Spotify, or via a podcast app on your smartphone. We're also on your Alexa enabled device. And tickets are now on sale for our Penguin Podcast live event with Mallory Blackman at the Lowry in Manchester on the 31st of August.